to Common Connection. I'm your host, Brett Getman. Hey everybody, I want to introduce a special guest, Jason Payne. This guy puts the sexy business status, roof status on everything that he does. Uh, welcome, Jason. Thank you. Yeah, so Jason owns uh, a roofing company, a coaching business. Tell us about what all you own. So yeah, I own uh, State 48 Roofing. Uh, started in August, well, this upcoming August will be four years. From scratch, no investors, no help, no loans, just bootstrapping it. And That is wild, because how You big... didn't know that, did you? Well... Ish. I know you'd been in roofing for a long time. Yeah, since 2010. So I've yeah. been in roofing game for going on 14 years. Yeah, so you're not new to roofing. Right. But you started up State 48 Roofing four years ago. I've known you as State 48 for two years, yeah. and you've been big since the day I met you. Like, two years ago, you were huge. Yeah, two so. years ago when you met me, I only, I only had probably 20 or 25 employees. Okay. Now I'm up to like 76. How many crews is that? 13. 13 crews. You service all of Phoenix and beyond. Uh, all of Phoenix, uh, that's our main hub. We'll okay. go outside, like I do houses, a lot of, a lot of people that live in Phoenix have secondary homes in right. other parts Cholo, of whatever, yeah, Flagstaff, Flagstaff, yeah, Pine Top. And so we so, do a lot of that, so Heber, Overgard. <clears throat> we do that, we'll go down to Tucson. Nice. Tucson gets triple the rain. Oh. Compared to Phoenix, fun I didn't fact. Know that. Yep, Tucson hmm. gets triple the precipitation in Phoenix, so roofs go bad faster because you get more rain. Interesting. So, for, so if it's a full roof, uh, full roof replacement, it's a referral, a buddy, a client, a insurance claim, whatever, we'll yeah. go up there and We'll knock it out, tear it off one day, put it on the second day, and come yeah. home. Yeah, yeah, which is huge, especially in Monson. But yeah, in Phoenix, we'll do we'll do we do roof certs. We do you know obviously in the mortgage real estate world. Yeah, we'll do roof certs. We do inspection reports. We do bins requests. We do maintenance, repairs, full roofs, new construction, custom homes, multifamily, commercial, literally anything. And that's how we met. So uh, I work obviously with a lot of realtors, and you embrace the real estate community, which I think puts you apart from a lot of roofers. Some roofers take the opinion, oh man, why do I want to waste my time? They're just going to fix it and do a thousand credit at closing. And But you understand how important it is to embrace that as a potential contact, right? Uh, well, uh, the reason is because they don't want to spend the time, the energy, or the money to add value and educate the realtor on that we can do payment through escrow. So instead of getting giving a credit, here's the thing, you give a credit, that's assuming that the credit is enough to fix the repairs. Right. That the credit is, um, when you give a credit, it's not a tangible dollar amount. So you drop the price of the house for a $20,000 roof from 580 to 560, mm -hmm. it, your your payment goes down 10 bucks a month. It doesn't, you still have a 20, you still need a $20,000 roof. Right. Compared to when you go through escrow, we're actually getting the issues resolved because we're actually doing the work and those funds can't be allocated elsewhere or just absorbed into your mortgage. And, and time's not an issue because you can do an entire roof off and back on again in two days. Three, yeah, two, three days. And the lead time, like if for some strange reason, like uh, sellers, oh, you know, I can't have my roof done this week or whatever, and the closing comes, I mean, but you still, like that's still a win for you because the yep. new owner, now you have a relationship with where you can, you can instead of just fix the roof, maybe which maybe was all that was going to happen in the escrow, right? And it was like, oh hey, we have a conversation, okay? You've got or, three years of life left if you're lucky. Yeah, or let's, you can do it after. So even if let's say you don't need a roof, we'll still go back. out there. We'll still give you a bid. We'll still give you uh, pricing options because some people think roofs are like ten grand. I'm like, some roofs are ten grand if it's a starter home sure. and it's thirteen hundred square feet. Right, but you have a 4,000 square foot with a three car garage and a beautiful back porch and a huge front porch. And it's, it's like, squares, it's not yeah. square footage. Yeah, square I've footage, never yeah. understood the language of. Oh, so it's 100 to 1. So 100 square feet is a one 10 square. by 10. Think of like a 10 by 10. So that's okay. room. So you a 10 by 10 is 100 square feet, which is equivalent to one square. Oh, I always wondered. So how I have that a 40 works. square roof, you have a 4,000 square. See, I've always wondered that language. It's yeah. always like, and I know yep. a little bit about construction. Yeah, that's all it is. It. Yeah, okay. so like, oh, cool. And so that's what it comes down to is we can do we can do the work before you close, or they can do an escrow hold back, or they'll yes. close. And then once you close, then they will release the funds to us. 
transfer of ownership, yes. then we do the work with the buyer that's, so, that's recorded. So to, For anyone who's never done an escrow holdback, they are ridiculously easy to do. Yes. Uh, in very, Idaho, very where I'm from, when I used to be a realtor in Idaho, we would do escrow holdbacks on almost every new construction because it's the middle of winter, there's three feet of snow on the ground, and they can't roll sod. And right. so the builder promises front sod, and maybe in some cases even backyard sod. Yeah, in April. Or even paint. <laughs> Like if it's 10 below, you can't roll paint. And so you have to take possession of a home that's not painted or you know doesn't have sod in the front or back. Forget about other landscaping. You don't want to stick trees in the dirt and expose bare sure. roots to freezing temps. Sure, sure. Plus you can't dig a hole. The ground's Yeah, this broke. is all a like third world and yeah. So I mean, me. I don't know, I don't, anything, and so, anything under 75 degrees, I don't know yeah. what you're talking about. <laughs> that's my world I'm now. born and raised in Gilbert, <laughs> through, third generation Arizonan, so. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. if you don't be afraid of holdbacks and escrows, completely normal. Uh, and odds are, if you're working from clients that are from a cold weather climate, they are. Yeah, but in 2020, 21, and even part of 2022, before things you know kind of tapered down, uh, we didn't. I was. I'm, I'm normally doing one a week. Nice through escrow. Okay. But those two years, I was doing one a quarter. Very cool. Why? Because. Everybody's there. People are passing on home inspections. They're passing on appraisals. Which well, the home so inspection good. flags the roof, and ninety percent of the time the house will still appraise even if you need a roof. Um, but people are, are bypassing inspections, or they're getting inspections just saying, "Are there any like nine one ones?" And mm-hmm. if there are, cool. Well, guess what? You're asking. There, people are still doing ten, twenty, thirty, fifty thousand dollars over asking price. And oh, we want a roof, pound salt. I have 13 people that want to buy my house right now. Yeah. So it, it actually went against us when the market was so good and so hot. I was sure. Because there was no negotiations. There yeah. was zero. All my home inspector buddies were just getting waved out of even being in the deal. Yep. And, and to put it in perspective, you know, like what do we say when we're going to buy a home? Oh, let's get a roof over our head. I mean, that's like the cliche. Sure. And it's that important. Like if you've ever lived in a home, where the flipping roof leaked, that's like everything stops. That can destroy your property. It's the third. It's the third most important thing uh, according to a study. Mm-hmm. It's the third most. It's always top ten, but mostly most of the time it's top five. Mm-hmm. A reliable vehicle is actually number one. Oh. Um, over AC, which I don't know how it's true. They probably did it when not in Arizona, <laughs> but yeah. like having having your house like a cool home. Um, so having air conditioning is my opinion. Number that's a one. showstopper. Yeah. Yeah. Big time. Like this the second that happens, shit hits the fan. Yeah. It's big like, time. okay, stop yeah, everything. So that's number one, <laughs> a reliable vehicle, obviously to get around, whether it's school chores, mm-hmm. work or all the above. It's a reliable vehicle. And then a, a, a functioning roof. If it's funny enough, it's, if it's in the garage, front porch, back porch, negligence all day happens okay. a lot. People really? neglect it for years. Yeah. Cause it's in your garage and it's like, whatever, it's something, yeah, you got mold or maybe you don't got mold and it's just mm. cosmetic bandaid, but it's an, it's the garage. Yeah. But when it's over my beautiful new kitchen or my master bathroom sure, or over my kid's crib, yeah, crap happens fast. Yeah, absolutely. And to put this in perspective, so I just moved here in 2019 from the Northwest and I was talking to one of my home inspector buddies and I said, Hey, you know, I've already bought a house here, but just curious, like, you know, cause he, he was a home inspector in Phoenix for like 32 sure. years experience. Oh, well. And, uh, I said, what's the number one thing that you see as a home inspector? Cause you're doing two of these a day for 30 years. What's the number one thing you see without hesitation? He said, roof. He said, they just, he said, I don't know why. He said, I'm not an architect, I'm not a builder, but I can tell you that the roofs, many of the roofs in this Phoenix area just weren't designed right. Um, and, and then not only having the right design, they weren't built properly. And he there's, sees more issues with that. Th- there's a lot of truth to that. Um, the other part too is that uh, the guidelines and the standards and the expectations in Arizona, especially in Phoenix, are low, right? You get away with murder. We're you get one away of, with the flat roof. <laughs> yeah, the flat, yeah, flat, <laughs> flat roof, yeah, like, and so the reason why is because we don't have any extreme weather. Yeah. We don't have snow. We don't get, you know, 50 inches of rain a year. We right. don't, you know, it's, it's not Seattle where it's rainy 300 days a year. It's sunny 300 days a year type right. deal. Yeah. And so when people understand that, like, it, we... <laughs> but we get some pretty significant rains in the summer. Yeah, but but it's so it, it's so short and quick and hit and miss that yeah. people are like, hey, just hold out for 
the, right. the month or six week monsoon season. Yeah. And the other 10 months, it doesn't leak or rain. Right. So people will literally, I've been to a house one year, love crazy rains. Oh, give me a bid, give me a quote. Let me think about it. Let me do this, let me do that. By the time they spend the four or six weeks to think about it, the rains have stopped, monsoon season's over, and they get eight, nine months, 10 months yeah. of clear weather, for lack of better words. Right. And so out of sight, out of mind. Yep. They don't fix it until yeah. the next year. And they're like, oh my problem. gosh, it's, it's still here. And I'm like, uh, duh, you didn't fix it. Now, you might know this. This may be an insurance question, but it's my understanding that when a home has a roof leak and there's water damage, it gets put on some sort of national register or I don't know if you've ever heard this before. Nope. Um, so one of the, so hold that thought. I mean, I'll do some research, but I was told that there now is a, because of mold and so many people's sensitivity to mold, I'll confirm that and see. But anyway, um, it's certainly not something you want to play with, you know, because you get no, a lot no. of intrusion. And right. And that's, and that's the thing is the also, also very forgiving. No, not relevant in Phoenix. We don't, we don't have mold issues in Phoenix compared to the rest of the country. Correct. Um, molds food source is moisture. Well, yep. there's no and moisture. Darkness. And yeah, there's, there's no moisture in Arizona. No. <laughs> there's yeah. not. But where your constant water sources are, right? Washer, Mm -hmm. fridge right sinks toilets plumbing like lakes yeah, yeah all that they're, then they're well that's where they go hang out right and, and that's why if there is such a list and i'll confirm this um that's why the list exists yeah is because they want to keep track of that for insurance i'm sure purposes. that it would be relevant if they filed an insurance claim and there was Correct. mold maybe that does go on a list yeah but for normal roofing never in 14 years i haven't even heard of yeah, okay, that okay okay and you know. we 90 percent of our work is not insurance related oh um, because we don't have insurance claim unless you, it's a microburst sure. and it's wind related. And most of the time you're not dealing with mold and a leak. You're dealing with just damage, like exterior damage mm -hmm. where exterior shingles are flying damage. off, yeah. tiles are falling off, falling yeah. off or flying off. Um, so there's not a lot of, uh, interior. And the thing with mold is that when you get one rainstorm, 90% of the time, you're not going to have mold immediately, mm -hmm. right? It needs to grow, it needs time. to develop, it needs to get trapped. You're growing a crop in your attic. <laughs> yes, yes, it's it, it's not a, it's not a, you know, drop it once and all of a sudden like, oh my gosh. Now in Florida and in Chicago and Humidity, Houston, Northwest, that could happen. Anywhere. Yeah. I, I've seen video, YouTube videos where like literally the entire inside of an attic mm -hmm. is black. I've seen that as well. Uh, not really, I've never seen that in, in Arizona, nor will you because there's not yeah. enough humid, not a, yeah. there's not enough moisture yeah. uh, for it to get trapped. I lived in so. Oregon briefly and literally moss would grow on the driveway, outside, broad daylight. On the roof. On the roof yep. and on concrete. Yeah. Like where I'm parking my truck. Like there would be two tire tracks in the moss on my driveway. Yeah. <laughs> so we don't have that problem here. Um, but quick question. So, State 48 Roofing, how did you get sexy roof status? And obviously it's been a brand that transferred over to your coaching, which we'll talk about, mm -hmm. sexy business status. So What's sexy, the story? sexy roof status, believe it or not, from where we are right now in Chandler, about south, about two or three miles is a big development neighborhood called Sun Lakes. Oh yeah. And so I was in Sun Lakes four, five, six, six or seven years ago. And I had an old, old lady in her 80s um, she had an ugly terracotta red roof and she tore it off and there you can go back with other colors and she went back with the asphalt shingle roof and it was a gorgeous, I think it was a brown or a beige or a tan. And um, she comes out and we're done doing the final inspection, final payment, all that stuff and she's like, that's the sexiest roof I've ever seen. And I'm like, <laughs> and I was like, sexy, huh? She's like, yeah. And I think. I don't know if she was like flirting or trying to hit on me too. I don't, it was weird, but <laughs> I was like, but she literally said, that's a, that's a sexy roof. And I was like, okay. That stuck. And then, and so that stuck with me and I'm like, yeah, I was like, you know what we do? Like it, it's honestly, it's an attention getter. You sure. It's on all my vehicles. Of yeah. When people look at my vehicles, the first thing they see, the first thing they recognize and the only thing they remember, I've had people call me. Yeah. Uh, call, call Jason at 48 state. I'm like, <laughs> um, true story. Well, and if you don't live in Arizona, you don't yeah. know that Arizona is a 48th, 48th state. state. Yeah. And so, and it rhymes. I'm like, bro, I'm giving you every, I'm throwing you as many, you know, handouts as I can. And you still like, yeah, with Jason with 48th state. And I'm like, what? <laughs> um, 
<laughs> but they always remember like, oh, you're the yeah. sexy roofer, you're the sexy yeah. roof guy, or oh, that's the sexy, yeah. the sexy roof company. That's awesome. That's what. It, so it's it's catching momentum. I knew there was a story there. That's why. Yeah, I had so that story. Literally, yeah. 80, 80 plus year old lady in Sun Lakes, tore wow. the roof, put it on. She's like, that's a sexy roof, and I ran <laughs> with it. And so every piece of my marketing is on there. Um, and I tell people, I had people like, take it off. It's, you know, it's defensive. It's offensive towards women, all that bull crap. And I'm like, you find me any piece of content anywhere on the internet that has that hashtag and anything inappropriate. I was like, I will give you my roofing company. Right. Yeah. It's no, not a thing. It's like, cause it's not sexy. It's not sex. It is sexy roof, roof status. status. Yeah. So the status of the roof is sexy. Well, what's sex? Well, what's sexy? It depends what your definition of sexy, sexy right. is. And that's not yeah. my job to educate your kids or yeah. whoever yeah. on what that is. What's sexy? Like, I think that truck itself is sexy. Right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think yeah. it's a sexy podcast room. Like, yeah. You know? Right. And, but people are, some people are silly, but yeah. that's what it comes down to is I believe that in the, in the trades space, that we get bad raps, you got the plumber with the crack, all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I believe that pe people just talk crap about the trades. And I was like, there's more millionaires made in the trades than there is any other form of business. Love it, man. I mean, absolutely. Like this could almost be like a separate discussion down the road for us, but let's dig into that. Like, um, tell me how you chose uh, when you were coming out of high school you know, we all make decisions. And uh, sure. I was really pushed to go to the college route. Mm. And uh, although all my summer jobs were working with my hands, and to this day, like welding is one of my favorite things. But like a hobby. Yeah, it is a hobby. Um, but I mean, uh, I, it feels like, you know, with people like yourself and Mike Rowe and, you know, other people out there that are really trying to put an emphasis back in trades, construction which I feel like we desperately need. Um, no regrets with how I live my life, but I mean, I some often think about, hey, you know, I should have just stuck with framing houses. I, I loved it, it was fun. Um, so how did you get into construction? So I got into construction, so I, I played sports all through high school, I played football okay. and baseball, so my parents didn't make me work or get a job. Um, in the summer, I worked three jobs. Okay. I owned a hay, a, 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 we called it say hay, so okay. we would take I would take bales of hay to the neighbors for their cows, their horses, and all that stuff. So I literally delivered bales of hay. Um, and then I owned a lawn mowing business, and then I was a lifeguard. Nice. Um, so I did all three of those all through high school. And um, so the work ethic, working outside of my hands, not a problem to me at all. Hated school, hated sitting at a desk. You know, a podcast after an hour, I'm like, bro, I gotta get up and move. Yeah, you gotta get up Can't and move. Can't sit down, I was like, I was like I'm getting the, you know, get twitchy. Yeah. Um, so I'm LDS, started a mission for my church, went to Mexico City. Okay. Um, came back and started doing landscaping for about a year, year and a half. Okay. As an irrigation tech. So all the little drips systems and valves and controllers and all that stuff. I did that for nice. a big company here in Gilbert. And my uncle called me, sorry, my uncle's son, so my cousin called me and said, hey, um, I'm moving to Chicago to buy my, start my own company or buy, buy an existing roofing company. Do you want to come? Um, uh, be a production manager and, and help run the business. And I'm like, yeah, sure. I was like, I don't know anything about roofing. I was literally like, <laughs> went on a mission and did landscaping for a year and a half. I'm yeah. Like, but I was like, work ethic, yeah. driver's license, fl uh, bl uh, fluent in Spanish. That's, yeah, I was going to ask all I needed. that. A lot of people don't know that you're really fluent in Spanish. Yep. So in 2010, um, January of 2010, I was making $12.50 an hour. And my uncle gave me a job for $14 an hour. That's awesome. And I thought I could go get approved for a Lambo. Yeah. <laughs> Dead sir, my, that's how my mindset was. I was like, dude, I won the freaking lottery. Right. True story. So yeah, I started in the roofing industry in January 2010, making $14 an hour. Right on, man. So, and from there I just, I, I did production and production was a salary position. I want to make more money. It's like, well, you, do, you, you can't not do, do production because I don't have anybody else. I said, well, I want to make more money. Um, so he's like, well, go sell too. I'm like, okay. okay. So I went and sold a million dollars a year. Okay. Uh, and apart from that, I, I did production. And then over time, the, it bridged that gap where I was able to hire production people and did only sales and became a sales manager and became a GM and uh, ran the thing and kicked butt. And then the day came where I was like, I want to make more money. Well, I'm right at the top of the food chain. What do I do now? Ownership. Ownership. And uh, didn't, long story short, didn't work out mm -hmm. and uh, left, 
went to a, a competitor and went did outside sales, sold 2.3 million in 12 months. Nice. The crazy part about this going into marketing is that was 100% self lead generated. Oh, really? I never took a lead from, from that business. It was all from the, the, my nine years of just creating relationships, yep. networking. Yeah. Um, and uh, people, people want to work with people. Yep. And so I'm a people person and every chance I can get to shake someone's hand, even the gal out here. We walked, yeah. walked in here, right? Right. Went out there and said, "Hey, what's your name? I'm Jason. Pleasure yeah. to meet you." Right. Even if it's just that. Yes. But it's it, Grant Cardone teaches this. They said, "Who's got my money? Strangers have your money." Yeah, that's, that's right. right. Never freaking tell your kids to don't talk to strangers. Yeah. Strangers have your money. My parents don't cut me a check. My yeah. grandparents don't cut me a check. My kids don't cut me a check. My sister and brother don't cut me a check. My sister and brother-in-law don't cut me a check. My cousins don't cut me a check. Strangers cut me a check. That's huge. And I have to tell you. Like I grew up in the Northwest in a very resource-based economy. So what I mean by that is, you know, it was a, it was a logging town, sawmills, and honestly, we felt like we, I don't want to say that we felt like money grew on trees, but for us, money was trees. And I wasn't a logger, uh, but logging and those types of resources were the heartbeat of the town. And it wasn't until uh, in my 20s, and I moved to LA, and I realized that the money comes from people. You can have. I mean, there is a bridge coming out of it. But so any, anyone listening that you know grew up in a resource-based town, understand that there is a whole nother world out there. That if you are ever afraid of the big city or whatever, like it's a thing. Like provide a service to people, and you get paid for it. Like. Yeah, get to and, know people. And so Andy Elliott's coming to our event um, in July, and he talks about how um, you are you are in the helping people business, not in the sales business. Mm -hmm. If you help people, that's right. That's that's where it goes. Number one. Number two is find find or develop, create, innovate, whatever a solution to someone's problem. And it doesn't matter, go to LA, go to New York, whatever. It's in the small town, like the logging thing, all that it was is logging. Right. Well, there's 500 or 5,000 or 50,000 different types of logging things in the big city. There were, yeah. In People Phoenix. Providing chainsaws and, yeah, and log trucks and yeah, in tires. Phoenix, exactly. In Phoenix, in, like I said, I'm born and raised here, third generation Arizona, and, and there was never a, a niche. There was never a one, like a logging. I know exactly what you're talking about. There's towns that were like. Yeah, that's, that's, everything is on surrounded by yeah, one thing. Yeah, even in e, uh, eastern Arizona, everybody, they they work in the mines. Mines. Mines, copper mines, mines whatever. Co yeah, copper mines, coal mines. And like, oh, I work in the mine. My dad worked in the mine for 40 years. And the mine, 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 mine. I'm like, dude, I was like, there's so much more outside of that. People just get intimidated mm -hmm. because there's so much opportunity where when they were there, there was only, you could only do one of these three or four things. Yeah. Um, and so... Uh, school was never a thing for me. I hated it. Um, and I, I, like I said, I, the, the blue collar game, I wasn't scared to sweat. Still, mm -hmm. I'm not scared to sweat. Yeah. Um, although I look pretty now, but I'm not, I'm not scared. I'm not scared <laughs> yeah. to sweat at all. Right. And, um, and at the end of the day, the, the service based industries are never going to go away. As long as people live in houses, mm -hmm. those houses need to be maintained. They yeah. will not be neglected yeah. and they're not going to get bulldozed. That's not something that AI is ever going to take from you or anyone else that provides a tangible service where you know you have crews nailing boards together putting roof shingles on laying tar paper yeah ai is never going to take that like no. it's, it's just not going to happen not, not anytime soon right i mean uh, i don't think we're going to live to see a robot hop on a roof and replace it uh just, they're actually coming out with a, a robot that will install asphalt shingles on a roof oh there you go okay right now but the, <laughs> the case in point being is uh well, or try, trying to but it's more of a, it's more of a robot type system yeah. anyways but i think that i think that ai and tech will help make putting roofs on more efficient sure and more quickly to save people money or to not have insurance claims and not have yeah. malpractice and workmanship issues. Yeah. Um, I see that there, but yeah, at the end of the day, it's like diagnose, fix it and do it. That's what I, the other part where I love about roofing. My dad's been doing flooring for 40 years. And he asked me, he was like, do you want to cut or do you want to, do you want to end? I was like, no, I was like, one, mine is recession proof. Like roofing doesn't go away. I joined in 2010, Floor. January, 2010. Yeah. I, like I've never seen, never seen a downturn from, from roofing. Right. Um, it's just not a thing. Flooring. What's I mean, Economy gets tight with additions, remodels. Yep. You know, flooring is part of that. 
Yeah. And I was like, so it's that's the first thing when things laundry. condense yeah. and collapse and contract, roofing, it's, that's never going to be a thing. And how many people want to get up on the roofs and are not scared of heights? Right. Or have a ladder, own a ladder, or that want to go fix it themselves, especially in the concrete tile base. Um, asphalt oh. shingles, I've actually had a handful of homeowners or smart type, I don't say smart, but gutsy type people try and redo their own roofs. Mm -hmm. Because asphalt, it's easier to install. It just sure. is. Yeah. But concrete tile roof, dude, nobody wants to touch that. Nobody knows how to fix it. Mm -hmm. And that's, I'll be job security for me forever. Yeah. <laughs> it's never going to go away. It's not. Now, I got to ask. So you're bilingual. Mm -hmm. How big of a secret weapon is that for you? And how, how does that play into your business? Uh, I ironically watched 007, uh, No Time to Die, last night. And uh, as close to that as, as it can get. It's a, it's a massive, massive weapon. Yeah. And it is an opportunistic weapon. It allows me to have conversations with people. Um, that's how I got into the industry in the first place. Um, it gets me, it can and has gotten me out of jams, not like legal jams, but um, go, traveling, traveling, oh. traveling here locally, um, hiring and qualifying more qualified people. Yeah. I can have a conversation in Spanish that are like, oh, I'm a good roofer or I'm a good roofer in Spanish and English and the, that barrier. I can have a more thorough conversation in regards to hiring our crews. 90% of our crews are either Guatemalans or Mexicans. Okay. So Spanish. You can sift through the BS too. And so I can have I can have that next level and there's a natural level of respect. If I speak Spanish and you don't, and there's a crew over there or guys over there, you don't know English. I, I have more power and authority than you do because you don't. Yep, 100%. Now. What are so I this is a good That's a stereotype, a good, but it's yeah, it, yeah, yeah, I 100% believe that there's got to be a good story living there where you talked yourself out of a jam, like uh, yeah, well, traveling, I, it, it or, wasn't work related, but yeah, so we go down to Rocky Point all yeah. the time, and uh, yeah, so it actually it went against me, believe it or not. So if you play dumb and you're like, yo, cervezas, like boobies, yeah. like Rocky Point, vamanos, <laughs> yeah. that's literally how I talk, and I have my wife sitting next to me, and kids in the back, <laughs> and I've lived down the back, yo, cervezas, like. Wife and I, yeah, vamonos. That, <laughs> true story. True story. That's happened more than once. And you play dumb, they'll, they'll be like, oh, brrr, and start asking you questions. And they're like, yo, bro, like, no, no, no hablo ingles. Like, yeah. hablo. Albano, where are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. biblioteca <laughs> library, right? Um, and so you play dumb like that. Yeah. They don't want to go through the hassle. Most of those guys at the border, this is all stereotype, right? But yeah, yeah. Uh, where you cross to go, to go to Rocky Point, 90% of them don't speak a lick of English or they don't want to go through the hassle of it. Of trying to, yeah. Right, but if you do speak Spanish, now guess what can happen? Hey, this also happened as well too, and, and until I learned my lesson. Hey, um, hey, what's up, man? Brr, and I'll, I'll go back. Hey, que paso? Ba, 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 in Spanish. So now it's like, hey, get out of the truck. Hey, open up the trailer. Hey, where are you going? Do you have any guns with you? What vegetables are, you know, all Because he knows all that you stuff. have money. He uh, knows you have money, but apart from that, they, he knows that he can have a legitimate conversation with me because of his language barrier that yeah. I catered to. Yeah. Instead of playing stupid, then right. you get the dumb the guys that really don't know English and like, dude, Rocky Point Beach, cervezas party, and they'll be like, go, just get out of here. Yeah. And so uh, that's what I do when I go down. That that's that is the that secret card I'm gonna keep in my back pocket. And if they don't, if I play that way, and they know that they think that I don't know how to speak Spanish because I play dumb. Then if it, this is also like for security purposes for my family, sure. if I feel people saying certain stuff or doing certain stuff you in know. Spanish, they, but they think that I don't know Spanish, right. then I can pick up like, hey, this is not a good situation, or hey, like someone's trying to screw me, right. or or somewhere in between, or trying yeah, to get money. I didn't money. think of that. I mean, yeah, you know, and that's that's, that's like that's true number stories. one right there. Yep. Like you just hear people talking, and you know what they're saying is not a good thing to be around. It's like, yeah. okay. But it also is a massive help. So if like we're trying to go somewhere or something breaks down mm -hmm. on the, the truck or the toy hauler or the boat or whatever, um, I can I can go and have a legitimate conversation instead of like, hey, you know, and the 95% and of people, they, yeah. they, they don't speak any English. Yeah. Right? And so it, it, it gets me out of a lot of uh, bad situations mm -hmm. if they occur. But the one on the border actually got me into a bad situation because I knew it. It's interesting. So, I mean, obviously, I've only lived here for four years, but there seems to be two camps about going to Mexico. Some people are like, hey, it's fine. And then other people say, eh, it's worse than you think. Like, I don't even know what to believe. Well, I've been down there 50, maybe 60 times. This year? 
or oh, in total? <laughs> total, not yeah, this okay. year. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. I wish. No, no, no. I, I, but I, since I was 15, I'm 36 now. Since yeah. I was 15, I went twice a year, at least twice a year for. You had any experience ever the shakedowns or anything, or nope. like, give me 20 bucks, you nope. roll the stop sign, you don't nope. see any of that. I don't roll stop signs. Okay. Well, because I've had people say I'm not, I'm not I drunk. didn't. Yeah. And they were stone sober, kids in the car. Yeah. And ooh, hey, you rolled yeah. that stop sign. It's like, no, I didn't. And the other part too is once again, if you play dumb and you act like you don't have any money and that kind of stuff, you can you can get out of stuff. Okay. Um buy a special car that's like an old beater. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's got a hemi in. <laughs> yeah, and, and honestly yeah, like I said, and honestly, if you're just like straight shooter with them and yeah. you're just like honest and upfront and tell them what's going on. Yeah. Most of the time, they'll leave you alone. Okay. But when you're stupid or doing stupid stuff, or 90% of them, when they go down there, they drink because there's no police to enforce right. you know, DUI type West. stuff. Yeah. And I don't drink. And so I, I, I would, on four-wheelers, side-by-sides, these dudes, they'll flip side-by-sides and quads all the time down there. Sure. All the time. Okay. Because they're intoxicated. Right. And so, but if you're not, like I said, I go down with my family and several other families, never have a problem. I, the police know who I am. So I'm now an asset and an ally, not oh, an wow. enemy. Yes. Okay. I go in there, I'll actually, a little fun tip. This goes for anybody, by the way. It has nothing to do with going out to Mexico or Rocky Point. If you want to get on someone's good side, bring them drinks and bring them food. No, like, oh. you can bring them alcohol too, but like. But just, yeah. 12, eight, hey, like the, they call them federales, right? Go down there, take them a 12 pack of Coke and some tacos. Hey, just want to let you know, I, every time I pull into camp, because we go for like a week. Okay. And we go stay on the beach. Oh. And most of the, most of the police guys will stay in town. Okay. And what I do is I just, I'll bring them like burritos, tacos, and like a 12 pack of uh, beer or a 12 pack of like Coke. Mm-hmm. And I'll just be like, hey guys, like what's this for? And I'll be like, hey, be like just let you know. It was like me and my family are staying down there. Do you guys mind, when we're not here, do you guys mind watching out for us? Yeah, dude, not a problem, awesome. And like, no, they're like, yeah, we got you, we got you. Oh, yeah. because I brought them $20 worth of freaking tacos tacos and, and Coke. Coke. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's literally, but, that's but good tip. what you did is you're, you're showing them, you're proactively showing them respect. Yeah. And, and their authority. They know who you are, name with a face, because all these other guys going down, they're like glaring at them, like, what do you want? Like, oh, here's the police, and we're, we're in trouble. Yeah. Flip it. Yeah. Yo, we're buddies. Hey, you got anything? Hey, I'm also bilingual. If you have any questions, right. let me know here to help. My family and I will be down at the beach. Oh. We'll be there all week. If you have any questions, come let me know. Oh, thanks, man. Boom, boom. Fist That's bumps huge. and all that crap. And guess what? No problems. Zero problems. Nice. Ever. Okay, so um, pivoting, let's talk about coaching. So coaching. you're coaching. very passionate coaching's about, gangster. yeah, how are we doing on time? We're doing good. Because yeah. I know you got another thing. Um, on, 15 minutes. Okay, perfect. Perfect. So you love to coach. You I love mean, to coach. Since, since I've known you for two years, I've always seen the passion in your eyes about helping other business people elevate their business, bring their game up. I mean, tell me how you got into that. Um, I didn't really truly get into it until about a year ago. Well, okay. Maybe, maybe 14 maybe, months ago. Okay, yeah, it was about a year and a half ago. But, then, yeah. um, uh, but my content has always been related to that. It's yeah. always been, uh, some people are really good at their craft, and that's the only thing they know how to talk about and okay. help educate and whatever, roofing. All I do is roofs, and all I know how to do is roofs, and all I do is roofing. Mm-hmm. Cool. But I'm like, well, I'm not just a roofer, I'm a business owner. Right. So that's a whole like if you're if you are a roofer but you own a business if you're a roofer and you're an employee you're a roofer that you're just an employee of a roofing company. Yep. But if you're a business owner, it's a whole billion dollar industry on the other side. Mm-hmm. And if you're a business owner that has actually built a business and that has experience and has been through you know hard times and has and has actually built something that's experience mm-hmm. and people will pay for yeah. experience. That's yeah. what coaching is. I, I, so I went to uh, your MenaceCon conference last, I think it was January. January. And uh, man, oh man, was it awesome. You had some huge names. Ed Milet, Sean Whalen, Grant, uh, oh, it's a Grant Cardone. Uh, Grant, Grant will be on my stage one day. Um, Bradley. Yeah. Bradley. Bradley yep. Yeah. Bradley, Kent Clothier, Los Hustle, Pace Morby, Tommy Mello, Natalie Dawson, Brandon Dawson. Yeah. yeah those was, names are huge. Crazy I mean, names the best and I, you know, I've been to you know over the years a lot of different conferences and heard a lot of pep talks and heard a lot of sure. rah 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 speeches the motivational speech that Ed Milet gave was without a doubt the best I've ever heard there's no close second place and to think that we were you know like 20 feet from him you know it was really awesome so I'm really looking forward to his book's called The Power of One More yeah and it's an audible too best top five books Okay. Yeah. 
so good. What was it like working with some really big names, bringing them in, and and you were kind of the you were pretty much the MC. I was MC, mm-hmm. putting all that together and yeah, scheduling. What was that like? It's uh, two things. One, those are, those people are very very powerful, not in like a Hitler Nazi way, yeah. <laughs> not like in a communist way, but in a they are so dialed in on what they want and their focus wow. is unbelievable really yes they are very dialed they know exactly what they want they know exactly how to get it and they are doing the things necessary in order to get it so does that come across like i think i'm reading you on this it's not coming across like a list of demands and but it's it's a focus so like do you have an example yeah so ed my sent me an email or his assistant sent us an email and said hey he wants to fly this plane on this flight at this time, be picked up in a car, be, he needs to be ready to speak X minutes before um, when he gets back <clears throat> or when he lands. Uh, his, actually son, his actually son plays golf here in, in Tempe oh, for yeah. a he local university, like yeah. a Christian university. And um, so his son picked him up and dropped him back off at the airport. But um, a lot of these guys, the, the, the bigger ones that vet truly, truly value their time, and Grant talks about this in one of his books, he went to Vegas and uh, flew private, didn't have his own jet then, flew private, did an event, and within like an hour or two after he spoke, he was already on a plane headed back to Florida. And he's like, hey, you're not gonna stay here and hang out and gamble and stuff? And he's like, why? He's like, I have shit to do. So a lot of these guys, Brad Lee, for example, I personally went and picked up Brad Lee, picked him up, uh, dropped him off, uh, you know, went backstage, all that stuff, maybe an hour before he spoke, spoke for 45 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, at, stay for about 10 or 15 minutes after pictures and high fives and signatures and, and all that stuff. And then I literally took him back to the exact same airport, got in the plane. And he's like, I can go, sp-. people, he values his time with his wife and his kids. Mm-hmm. So he's like, he set it up to where I will speak at this time or this time mm-hmm. because I can leave, I can still, I don't have to leave early crazy in the morning. Right. I can still say hi to my wife and my kids. I go and I fly, I speak, I fly back and I'm home before five o'clock. Sweet. And Sean Whalen stuck around for a little bit and did some photographs. Yep. So yeah. I picked up Sean and Sachs too. Yep. Um, yeah, they're they're amazing. He's a, he's probably my favorite mentor. Really? Changed my life. Really? Yep. Changed my marriage. I almost got divorced. Like he's he literally helped me. I would say he saved my marriage. His experience and his mentorship helped me save my marriage. Wow, that's awesome. Hands down. Because he was vocal on one of his podcasts about him, him and Sachs. I just posted it. One of the best episodes he came out with was just a little bit ago. Okay. It's 30 minutes long. Okay. It talks about date night and it talks about, and I actually coach this too because I've heard it from so many of them Mm -hmm. that I'm internalizing it and now doing my twist on it. But quickly he talks about how I I teach to be an extremist. It's like right now my phone is literally on the ground over there. Why? Because it's a distraction. Yep. And I need to be here. Yeah. I need to be focused. My wife can't get a hold of me. My COO can't get a hold of me. My client can't get a hold of me. Why? Because I respect this time. And now on a podcast, it's even more more important, right? Because yeah. you're like, oh, hold on, let me just take a phone call real quick. Yeah, exactly. Right? But um, the crazy part that Sean Whalen just, I mean, literally a week ago, he put this out. And he said, "Do you, you put your phone on do not disturb for a podcast. You put your phone on do not disturb for work. You'll press the decline button when you're in a meeting with everybody else. But you go on date go night, on a date night and right. you answer your phone. You go on yeah. date night and you'll text. You'll go on date night and you'll be on social media. You'll go on mm-hmm. date night and you'll be on sports center. You go on date night and, and you're doing everything else except for being on date night. Yep. He's like, do you put your phone on the ground? Do you leave your phone at your house when you go on date night? Or is it on the table looking at it and you're and you're constantly looking at it going back and forth? Yeah. It's a distraction from that's all your wife wants. Yeah. I mean She wants your undivided yeah, attention, just 100%. like you give your undivided attention for your business. You need to give your undivided attention for your spouse for date mm-hmm. night. Same with kids. Yeah. I have five kids. I literally did this yesterday. I came home, got home. Uh, I normally am home between five and six, closer to five. I got home at like five, thirty-five, forty-five yesterday at meetings like all day, mm-hmm. all literally since from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. I know I don't have that many back to back to back, but I did. And got done, 30 minute drive home, got home by like 5, 5, 35, 45. I didn't look at my phone until 8 o'clock. Yeah. I had dozens of text messages, dozens of emails, <laughs> dozens of unanswered calls, and guess what? Yeah. I didn't go to business, right? Nobody died. Yeah. And if, they're, if they died, funny joke, not being morbid, but like, if they're like, some, 
if they're gonna die, they're gonna die whether I answer the phone or not. Yeah, you're not a you're not a paramedic. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, and like then. I can get to wherever you're gonna be before you bleed out or die. If they're yeah. gonna, they got in a car. So and so got in a car accident. Okay, I'm not taking a, the ambulance the is gonna come get him yeah, anyways. Exactly. Like, um, so it's kind of a, when you really see it that way, you're like, oh my yeah. gosh. But we uh, I teach people, don't be a firefighter, because mm -hmm. all you're doing is putting out fires. Like that's that's you're never gonna grow and scale a business if you're a firefighter. Yeah. So finishing with what Sean talked about is. He's like, when you're at work, be at work. Go 100%, be an extremist at work. Give 100% to your team, 100% to your employees, to your working out, personal development. Yeah. When you're at the gym, put your freaking phone away. Turn on music, go for it. But like, get a good freaking workout in. Yeah. People go to the gym for 45, 60 minutes. They'll talk to four or five people. They'll post stuff, look at stuff, all right. that stuff. Four or five selfies. <laughs> yeah, and, and they got a 20% a of 100% workout in. Yeah. But I go to the gym every day, but you're still, but I don't see any results. Yeah. Like, I'm not getting any results. Well, you go to the gym for an hour, but you're only working out for five minutes. Yeah, you're or just 10 holding minutes. down a bench. Right? Be focused right. with your kids. Yeah. So like I said, last night, I got home at 545. They look at my phone until 8 o'clock. I was intentional. I was on the ground. I was jumping on the trampoline. I was doing all those things with my kids. I sucked at that, by the way. That is a skill that is developed and learned to be able to do that. Well, I remember you told me over a year ago that... At five o'clock, like, like you know, because I've thrown a lot of events that you know I've invited you to from like three thirty to five, and you're like, you know, it won't always work for me because at five o'clock I'm, I'm in family mode and yep. don't call me, and you know, I, and not you that can I, call me. I there's mean, no answer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like, and not yeah. that I, like, not that I like, try to ring your phone off the hook or anything, but I've noticed yeah. over the years, like it's it already says you know on do not disturb mode, so it's yep. like. I applaud that. That's one of the most powerful pieces. That's a multi-million dollar device, that cell phone right there. Mm -hmm. Multi-million dollar device. The most advanced piece of technology the world has ever seen mm -hmm. is, a, is, a, is a, an iPhone. Oh, yeah. Um, the do not disturb button has changed my marriage, has changed my life, my personal development life. It has changed my relationship with my kids. Wow. Because it allows me to be intentional and be present with what I'm doing. I think what you've just said the last five minutes about not being a firefighter is so relevant. A lot of realtors will be listening to this. And it's, so stupid. it's an occupational hazard in our industry. I really feel like that. It's, it's the black lung so, of real estate. So here, I'm, not, I'm the, not a realtor, but let, yeah. me give, let me give my two cents on that. Yeah, yeah. And the, re the reason why, in, in my opinion, it is so crucial and so vital as a realtor, you can still be an extremist. And because I get blown up with them, their, their go time isn't 5 a.m. to 10 a.m. It's just not, no. right? Their stuff's evenings and weekends, cool. Right, exactly. But what happens is they give their all on the weekends and evenings to their clients. But then during the day, during the week, they're still giving their time and energy to their clients. Mm -hmm. Where is the break? Where is the, where is the quality time with your spouse? Mm -hmm. Where is the quality time with your kids? Yeah. If Saturdays and Sundays, like who made this in corporate America? Yeah, Saturdays and Sundays you have off. In, in real estate, there ain't no corporate shit. It's not mm -hmm. a thing. No. Right? And so if you're going to be, uh, uh, an ex if you're going to do what Sean Whalen teaches and what I teach, and you're going to be an extremist and be very focused, you should be spending that quality time with your kids during the week, mm -hmm. during the day. It's a boundary that was broken by our cell phones, to your point, because, yeah. you know, prior to the cell phone, because um, I was a realtor in 2004 when the iPhone wasn't a thing. Sure. I mean, it was a Trio 650, which was like a blackberry yep. is device. And mm -hmm. those were like cutting edge. Woo, and everyone was using flip phones. Sure. And, uh, the razors. He, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. Oh, yeah. But I mean, you know, even, you know, eight years prior to that, very few people had cell phones and they were 50 minutes a month, you know, and you had to make every minute count. It was for emergencies only. Right. And yeah, so now that we're accessible to our people, um, there has to be a balance, right? You know, uh, and, has... and the other part is you got to, there's another nugget. You need to set the expectation with your wife and with your kids of when I am available and when I'm not. Yeah, that's a good Just one. Just like you need to do it. Most people will do it with their kids and their wife because it's, it doesn't make them money. Right. So they're more than, they're more willing to say, Hey, I'm not going to play with you right now. I'm not going to go on date night with you or go to lunch with you or go to dinner with you right now because I'm doing, I'm working. When you flip it, that is what Sean teaches about. He's like, you need to, be, and I'll end with this. Sean says, you need to plan date night just as, a, just 
as much as you need to plan a meeting. Yeah. We do date night, what do we do? Okay, okay, cool. Uh, I just got home, let me th- shower real quick, throw on some clothes, and let's go run it to the near- nearest pub and-, and go get a drink or go get right, food. Right, exactly, yeah. Like, would you do that? Did the you do that with the podcast? Were you here 30 seconds before the podcast? Yeah, exactly. No! Yeah. You were here, you're setting up, getting the lights, getting the camera, getting the tech, getting the screens, you know, everything lined up. Sat down, right? popped a mic on you, rolling. Yes, and you go, but like, now I on the flip side was able to come in and just go like that, but on the, on my side, no, there's, there is preparation in order mm-hmm. to do that. Why are you not doing that with date night? Why are you not doing that with your kids? Yeah. Like, because you didn't, because we're all programmed that we don't have to and that our wives will accept that. Yeah. No, give, be, give 100% to your wife, right? Schedule the date night. Now, I, I know you have older kids. I have babies. But like, get a babysitter. Get the pajamas done. Get yeah. the bathtub done. Yeah. Get dinner no, set I've up. I've been there, man. Get, yeah. do, all the, do all those things mm-hmm. for your wife. Don't make her do that. Let her be in her room, pampering herself, straightening her hair, getting dressed, do all that stuff. That stuff still needs to get done though. Yeah. But when it's date night, that's part of date night. Right. Do that part. You're gonna have a much better experience. And then when you go, be intentional what you're gonna do. Put your freaking phone away and give your wife 100%, whether it's for 30 minutes or two or three hours. Yeah. Go spend a shit ton of money on her. Yeah. Because guess what? You'll spend a shit ton of money on cameras and on podcast equipment yeah. and on truck wraps. And then you go and you wanna you wanna cheap out on a, on dinner yeah. or on, yeah. on shopping with your number one person. Yep. And that's the reason why marriages suck and there's divorce <laughs> is because you are not giving 100% to your spouse. You aren't, not yeah, them. Right. And the reason why they're not giving you 100% back is because you're not giving 100% to them. Get, and then there's resentment. Yeah. Yeah. But if you would give yourself 100% to your spouse and to your kids, like you do your business, if you mm-hmm. are a badass business owner, that's where you're wrong. Love it, man. That's awesome stuff. How are we doing on time? We're done. Okay. Well, Hey, everybody, this is Jason Payne, State 48 Roofing, sexy business status. Uh, that's how people can find you, State 48. At Jason the Roofer. Jason the Roofer. There At you Jason go. Jason the Roofer. Everything's on there from fa- like talking stuff like this from family to wife to kids to sex to date night to uh, business coaching, you know, gr- taking your business. I-, I help take business owners from half a million to $10 million. Love it. That's what I do. And I, t- along the way, I do a couple things that nobody else does or very, very few people do. I help you become the best version of yourself. I help you reach your true potential. And then I help you take your business, your family, and your income to the next level. You're always welcome here. Uh, I love talking to you. Appreciate every, it. And, and I love learning stuff from you. So thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you Thanks very much. much. Yeah. Sure. You're welcome. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you on the next one. Adios. Adios.